Well, today we're going to finish what we started a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the question, what does biblical love look like in the church? Or we framed it a different way. What does it look like for us to love our fellow believer scripturally? Now, we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 3. So if you want to go to the Bible, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to reread verses 14 through 16, which we touched on a couple weeks ago. And 1 Timothy chapter 3... It's going to be the structure to how we're going to answer this question. It's going to be the guiding light we went over a couple weeks ago and how to answer this question. 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting verse 14, Paul is writing Timothy. And he says this, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing to you with these instructions. So that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up to glory. <laughs> Every time I read that passage, I always have to say amen. I, amen. I can't read that and not say amen. Now, Paul is highlighting something here. He's given us structure and how we should go about understanding and being instructed in God's truth. A couple weeks ago, we underscored instruction, conduct themselves, God's household, foundation of truth. The Word of God, as Paul is pointing this to, highlights, especially in this passage, that it instructs us in how we should conduct ourselves, and specifically to this question, what does biblical love look like in the church? Paul is highlighting how we should conduct ourselves in God's household, and then he nails it down and says that it is the foundation of truth. Paul points Timothy and us to search the scriptures to see how the church should love one another. So let's let's do that today. We're going to read a couple of scriptures, a couple of passages, a couple of verses, and we're going to ask the scriptures to show us how we are to love one another. Now the first scripture that we're going to touch on today is John chapter 13. So go ahead and open the Bible to John chapter 13. We'll be looking at verses 34 through 35. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll be putting the verses on the screen behind me. So Christ is addressing his disciples here. And he says this, starting in verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. A couple weeks ago, when we started to try to answer this question, I read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we discovered something in reading the love chapter, that love is hard. So Christ looks at his disciples and he says, a new command I give you, love one another. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4, says, verse 4 says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. This is like the opposite of like my attitude on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not sure if you can relate to that. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. See, our Lord is the greatest example of what it means and what it looks like to love one another. The Bible tells us that the greatest love is the one who laid their life down for another. And we know that to be the gospel, that Christ would lay his life down for his disciples, for his children, for those whom he loved. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. See, Christ isn't, isn't talking about a vague love here. He's talking about a specific love. He's addressing his disciples, and he's saying, hey, guys, guys, the world will know that you belong to me by how you love each other. So if there's quarrels, if there's fights among you, if there's envy, if there's jealousy, they'll be like, oh, that just looks like the world. They won't see that you're, you're mine. See, they'll see that you're, 
Your mind, by the way, you love one another. Christ is highlighting the love between believers. See, our love as Christians to one another must be different. It must be set apart from the way the love, the love of the world is, the way the world loves each other. We all know the expression of dog eat dog world, right? <laughs> Only the strong survive. But then you read the scriptures, and the scriptures say, Blessed are the meek. <laughs> Blessed are the humble, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful. See, it's the opposite. God's way is not the way of the world. I've said it in here before, and you might have even heard this expression in life. Reading this passage, you say to yourself, okay, all right, all right. I have to love everyone, but I don't have to like them. How many of us prescribe to that theology? The problem with that theology is it's wrong. See, because if we say, I have to love everybody, what you're saying is, as a Christian, you're saying that you'll die for everybody. You will lay your life down. But I promise you this. You will not die for somebody you do not like. If you can't stand the way someone's voice sounds when it hits your ear, if you can't stand their personality, you can't stand their look, you can't stand their smell, you can't stand having a conversation with them, you will not lay your life down for them. I promise you. See, love is an action. Yes. But love is also a feeling. Love is affectionate towards what it loves. See, God was affectionate towards us. His affection, his love for us, sought us out and found us and saved us. See, the Bible tells us that, that he calls out his own by name. And the shepherd knows the sheep, and the sheep know the shepherd. And the Greek word right here, this, this knowing, is a specific type of knowing that only a husband and wife have together. It's a deep, rich intimacy. And we see that our Lord is affectionate towards us because he knows us, because we're his. And in turn, this love changes us towards him. And then we're affectionate towards him. Why? Because he loves us. We see his love in action, but we also receive it in our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit through regeneration, where it changes our desires. It changes our passions, our affections, and our desires. This is a feeling that motivates us to live a different way. So love is most definitely a feeling, not just an action. Now, most of us, we've told people we love them, but our actions have said we hate them. But see, but Christ is different. He is the truth. He is the, the pillar. He's the foundation. And if Christ says he loves you, he shows it. Because he's affectionate towards those whom he loves. Now as Christians, we have two types of love. Two types. We have a love towards the lost. That's specific. It's different than our love towards the found, towards the church. Stay with me here. Our love towards the lost is a saving love. It is a salvational love where we preach of the one who laid their life down for another. So we preach to the lost the gospel, the one who laid their life down for them. And we preach them to repent and to believe in Christ as the way, the truth, the life, the only way to be right with God. We plead for God to have mercy upon their souls and open their eyes to the gift of Christ. That's our love towards the lost. It's a saving love. And our love towards the found, towards the church, is a sanctifying love. We lay our life down for the church. So we preach of the one who laid their life down to the lost. And then our love towards the church, a sanctifying love, we now lay our life down for the church. Because our bodies are now a living sacrifice. Does that, does that make sense? Everybody follow me here. And this is what grows the church up. It's as we lay our life down for the church. And we, we edify the church and we build each other up. Being rooted and established in the truth by the power of the Holy Spirit. The world will know that we are... Disciples, that we are Christians or Christ ones by the way we love one another. Now, let me just confess this to you. Because sometimes when I say we, I can offend the, the, the self out there. <laughs> so at Duncan, we're always taught, don't say we, say you. <laughs> just so you can exclude anybody's like walls from coming up. Sometimes I don't care, but I think it's important for me to share what I struggle with. What I mean, sometimes I don't care. I mean, sometimes I don't care if I throw you in the window. <laughs> With me, because I believe that we all fall short of the glory of God. 
So I think it's safe, you know, and anything that I offended you is probably your sinfulness that you need to confess and repent from. Amen? So I was like, no, shut it down. What are you talking about? I don't sin, honey. Yeah, she knows. Love keeps no record of wrong. She's keeping a record. The Lord's still working. But in all seriousness, if the world would know that we're disciples, by the way, we love one another. When I look at my own life, sometimes when I look at myself, I can, I can hate my fellow Christian more than I hate the sin that's within. I find myself some days in some seasons of being more loyal with the sinfulness in my own thoughts than I should be to the body of Christ. Like I have more loyalty to it. I will die for my sinfulness. I, I love it. But I haven't been called to love my sin. I've been called to love Christ. And in turn, if I love Christ, then I love my fellow believer. But some days it's a struggle. And, but this should not be. And that's why Brother Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 25. And most of us are familiar with this passage. But in the King James Version, this is NIV. Paul says, so that there should be no division in the body. See, when I love the sin that's within more than I love my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that are, are outside of me, I cause division in the body. I gossip. This is a problem. But that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Paul's highlighting that when we walk through this life as Christians, we're doing this together. We're all in the same boat as believers. As the lost are all in the same boat. As Christians, we're all in the same boat. We're in the good boat. But nonetheless, as we go through life, we will deal with, with hardship. We will deal with death. We will deal with sickness. We will deal with addictions. We will deal with divorce. We will deal with tragedies. And Paul says, when one member suffers in the body of believers, we all suffer with them. We all get in the boat together. Because we're together. But when one member rejoices, we all rejoice. When there's, there's a wedding, there's a, a birth, when there's something that celebrates, that gives God the glory, we, we, we worship God together. We rejoice in those moments. Those feel good. But the problem is, is that in this life, we have seasons of, of rejoicing, but then also sometimes we have seasons of suffering. But nonetheless, we will all go through different things, but the scripture says we don't have to go through them alone. See, what does believer to believer love look like? Galatians chapter 6 tells us that we are to carry each other's burdens. That's what it looks like. It looks like this. When we all find ourselves in the valley, when we all find ourselves in that deep, dark valley, whatever the circumstance is, the scriptures say that we're not alone. We carry each other's burdens. We walk through the valley together. See, there's comfort in that. Lost worldlians, people outside the saving grace through faith in Christ, they do life alone. That's where deep, dark depression comes from. Hopelessness. Because they believe they're in a boat alone and there's no way out. As Christians, we have the light. The Bible tells us that less of those who mourn for they shall be comforted. See, the scripture comforts us when we go through these valleys. But the scripture is made visible to us. The word of God is alive and active because Christians read the scripture and then they apply it to their life and then they engage with other Christians in their life. Amen? Um, let's go to another passage. Romans chapter 12. Open your Bible Romans chapter 12. And I'll start in verse 9. So right now we've so far highlighted what biblical love looks like between believers. So like, alright, there's an action, there's a feeling that takes place when we love one another in faith, in God's word. So we see that, okay, I'm, I'm kind of Brother Brown, I'm kind of seeing what biblical love is supposed to look like. I mean, you gave a couple examples, amen, but... But this passage, at the very beginning, is going to highlight something to us. What is my attitude towards biblical love? So we're seeing what biblical love between fellow believers looks like, but what does my attitude towards it need to be? Well, Brother Paul nails it down in Romans 12, starting in verse 9. Love must be sincere. There it is. What is my attitude towards loving my fellow believer? It must first be sincere. 
But I need the grace of God to be sincere in loving my fellow believer. I mean, I, I need to be cleansed of all my unrighteousness, all the things in me, those, those hidden agendas, those, those hidden motives, those things that, that have a hook when I'm trying to love somebody. You can still love the body of Christ with a simple hook in it. And Paul's saying, make sure it's sincere. Don't have a hidden agenda on why you, you're building a, a bridge with this relationship. Maybe you think this relationship has, has something that will benefit you. That's not sincerity and love. My attitude towards loving the body of Christ needs to first be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. As you read earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. Be devoted to one another in love. This is important. We, we read what love is earlier. And see, we got to make sure that when I'm, when I'm devoted to a relationship, when I'm loyal to somebody in the body of Christ, I must make sure that it's first and foremost sincere, but it's rooted in biblical love. That it's not rooted in sick codependency. That it's not rooted in wanting to be approved by this relationship. I have to make sure. Now, how do you make sure? Make sure it's sincere. Meaning that when you love them, you have no hook in it. You do not want anything in return. You're loving them because the scriptures command you to love them. And God has changed your desires towards loving people. Honor one another above yourselves. That can be difficult. That can be difficult. The Bible says if you want to be first, be last. How many of you guys love to be last? Nobody loves to be last. <laughs> it's terrible. Like you're you're in school and if you're like the you get the worst grade in the class, you're like, yes. <laughs> Treasure in heaven. No, you just didn't study hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's not what the Bible is saying. It's not saying don't be first in academics or, or sports or whatever. That's not what it's saying. It's saying in relationship with one another. I say this over and over again because I feel like it's, it's important. There's several passages that always run back through my heart whenever I'm preaching, whenever I'm talking. And Philippians 2 is always one of them. Because I can get conceited and arrogant quick. You might not be able to relate to this. See, that's that thing. But I know I can. And Brother Paul says, he says, Christ did not consider equality with God something for him to use for his own advantage. See, there it is. There it is. Honor one another above yourselves. Christ did. He's the name above all names. The Alpha, the Omega. The beginning and end. And he humbled himself to the form of a servant to nothing and was obedient unto death. Who am I? Honor one another above yourselves. See, when I do that, and specifically in the body of Christ, the world knows that I'm a Christian because that is abnormal behavior. See, we are supposed to walk in the supernatural behavior, not the natural behavior. Never be lacking in zeal. Now, I had zeal earlier when I was reading the, the schedule for the weekend. But as Christians, how can we never be lacking in zeal? Well, it's something we do here daily at Dunklin. The guys journal, they, they first look at their gratitude. So I can never be lacking in zeal because I always remember that place God found me. I always remember where He found me and where He saved me and where He brought me today and by God's grace where He prayed me. See, I, I never lack zeal because I know what I deserve and by God's great grace and mercy, I didn't take it. Man, I'm so grateful. And then I become zealous towards the things of God. Why? Because I know what I deserve. And then He empowers me by His Holy Spirit to, to seek and to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your, your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now I read this passage because it brings everything together that we've talked about thus far. This passage highlights what biblical love in the church looks like. We, we see that as we work our way through each verse. But it also highlights what my attitude needs to be towards biblical love in the church. It's sincere. It's holy. It clings to what is good. It's, it's humble. It's consistent. It's faithful. It never lacks zeal. It's joyful. It's patient. Prayer. We, we pray 
for one another, but we also take care of each other's needs. So what is the goal of biblical love in the church? First, it's to glorify God. And then second, it's to sanctify us, to make us more like Him. See, biblical love in the church is a ministering love. It means that God is applying something to us. And when God's love is applied to us, something leaves us. That is why 1 John 1, 9 is, is always something you need to keep near and dear to your heart. As the Spirit of God presses something upon me that I lack, I, I'm reflecting more of my old nature than my new nature, the Spirit of God enables me to confess my old nature, my sinfulness. And the Scriptures say, if I confess my sin, He's faithful just to forgive me and cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. This is a ministering love. But this is important. If my goal as a Christian in the body of Christ is to be, to be Christ-like, I can't get bent out of shape when I have unrepented areas in my life and I need tough love. I can't throw my arms in defense and start swinging at all my, my, my godly friends who are trying to love me. They're trying to administer God's love to me because I've been fighting it. But they love me. And they don't want to just let me be the way I am. So let's go over some of the major areas of where biblical love shows up in our lives. What it, what it looks like in a child of God's life. Now, the first place that biblical love shows up at, the first place that we, we apply biblical love in our lives, is iron sharpens iron. So this is scriptural love. As we talked about earlier, when we say what biblical love is, it means loving the way the scriptures tell us. Pretty, pretty simple. You don't got to be a theologian to understand what biblical love, love is. See, we are shepherded in God's word. But this can be hard because when you really get shepherded in God's truth, it exposes a lot of your lives. And it can be painful. It can be difficult. Iron sharpening iron. And say you have, you have two, two brothers who have totally two different theologies. They both want to be right with God. They, they, it's not about being right or wrong. It's like, well, I have a humble, sincere heart, and I don't want to be theologically right, theologically right. It's not about being dogmatic and my truth better than your truth because we're both seeking the same truth. And somebody's off. That's why we have two different theologies. And when we seek the truth together in humility and we're taught scripturally by sound shepherds and the word, things get shaved off of us. Iron sharpening iron. We become more sharper in God's truth. We're taught how to wield or yield, wield, yield the sword of wield? Wield. Wield swing. Where's my, where's my day? Wield. I said yield. Like, slow down. No. I was correct. Taylor, it's wield. <laughs> good. Good. Somebody was falling asleep. See, that was right. The Lord wanted to work some of that peanut butter out of my mind. Uh, somebody checked out. Then I just checked you back in. Amen? <laughs> iron sharpening iron. Right there. Something just got shaved out of me. 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, starting in verse 16 and into uh, chapter 4, highlights that iron sharpening iron and the importance of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, this is the not-feel-good part of Christian love. It's necessary, but it doesn't feel good. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I hate being rebuked. <laughs> Sometimes we hate being taught. We definitely hate being corrected. But what's the goal? We're being taught. We're being trained. We're being rebuked in righteousness because of our unrighteousness. Some things are, are getting ironed out. This is that sanctifying love. This is the growth that is necessary for us as Christians. Why is it necessary? Verse 17. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly put for every good work. Some of us in here are just equipped for some good works. God wants to equip us for every good work. And the number one place for training in righteousness, the number one place is the Bible, is the Scriptures. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and in the view of his appearing in his kingdom. I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, this last portion of this verse into 2 Timothy chapter 4 is referring to two things. 
a teacher of the truth and the receiver of the truth. The teacher of the truth needs to be patient in teaching the truth because the truth to the student can be foreign when it's taught. And so we must be gracious and we must be merciful when we teach the truth. Number two. The second place that biblical love shows up at. And this is what biblical love looks like. It's fellowship in the body of believers. As the scripture we highlighted earlier, one member suffers, we all suffer. One member rejoices, we all rejoice. The Ecclesiastes tells us that a triple braided cord is not easily broken. In the body of Christ, we, we do not have to walk alone. I've had the blessing and honor of doing life with some amazing godly people. I've also had the blessing and, and doing death with some amazing godly people but nonetheless we, we do life together we we do death together we'll have to bury many many friends but we will be there together we will weep we will mourn and god will comfort us through the process see the world will know that we're disciples by the way we love one another now this is i'm going to just stick this one out there because it needs to be out there because we are not as holy as we want to be we are not as spiritual as we want to portray. And so we must remember this when somebody offends you. See, the Bible tells us that we are to forgive because we've been forgiven. I am to love because I've been loved. I need to show grace and mercy because blessed are the merciful. So we must remember that in our day-to-day -day handlings with, with the church. It's easily... It's easy for us to get offended when we're arrogant and we're prideful. When you walk around in a sincere, humble heart, it's, it's harder to get offended. Number three, we carry each other's burdens. Galatians 6 2. As I've said earlier, we walk through the valleys together. We, we help with each other's needs. Number four, accountability. Right? Some of you guys just fall asleep now. You don't want to hear that one. Huh? This is tough love. We need it, but we do not want it. The problem with accountability is when I need it the most, I want it the least. This is tough love. See, Proverbs 14 says that there's a way that seems right to a person, but the end is death. Tough love is someone who loves you, and they step in the path in front of you. And they're like, whoa, 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 brother, brother, brother. Listen. Guys, we do this all the time with, with people who want to leave. Like, no, 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 no. You don't want to do this. You think this is a good decision? No, no, I promise you. There's a way that seems right to you right now. But over here is destruction. And I'm, I'm going to get in your way because I love you, because I care about you, because I have sincerity of love towards you. See, we need, we need help in all of our lives. I have to always remember that God chose the foolish things of the world. So therefore, I need help in my foolishness. I need people to get in my way, to step on the path. Galatians 6.1, we're familiar with this verse at Dunkel Memorial Church. If any, of us, if any of us is caught in a sin or trust us, you who is spiritual, restore that person. Matthew 18. If somebody has, has any ought or, or a, a sin against you, if they've offended you, you need to go talk to them. We need to iron this out. Number five, we pray for each other. And this is in no order of importance. We pray for each other. The Bible says we should pray for all things always. Paul says pray without ceasing, meaning we should live a life of prayer. But we don't just pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Say they have a need, we're like, well, Lord, we should step in and we pray. But we also are the hands and feet, and so therefore we should step in and fulfill that need if we have. Lastly, corporate worship, ecclesia. This is the church, as Hebrews 10 tells us, that we don't forsake this meeting together. This is valuable. Coming together, reading God's word together, studying God's word together, worshiping God together is very valuable. Now, lastly, I end today in Acts chapter 2. I believe that the early church gives us the best example of what it looks like to have biblical love towards our fellow believer. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. No division. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's that sincere love Brother Paul was talking about. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, not just some. Again, no division. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I think that passage highlights that. Some of us out there pray for revival. If you want revival, make sure that our relationships are healthy in the church. And see, when the light is good amongst the light, God tends to move a little more. And the early church was completely and utterly devoted to Christ. And what did God do by the power of the Holy Spirit through the preaching of His Son? Those, there was many people who were continuing to be saved daily. And added as members of the church. And so that's what I believe. If we're healthy, we present healthiness. And God will move and bring the lost to Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you.